Thanks for tuning in to this video from Exodus Church. We hope that it serves as a tool to guide you and to grow in you a love for God and His Word. Exodus seeks to be a redeemed people who worship and serve God in the world. And our invitation to you today is that you would join us as we hope to honor God, who He is, and what He has accomplished. We invite you to remind your own soul of the good news of the gospel today, from wherever you are and whatever this season looks like for you. Let's read Psalm 66, 1 through 4 together as our call to worship. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. This is the word of the Lord. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love Too vast and astounding to tell Forever existing in worlds above Now offered and given to all Fountain of beauty eternal The Father, the Spirit, the Son Sufficient and endlessly generous, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exultant they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness. All life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with color. You paint every shade in the sky. You say the dawn wakes as a non of Magnificent, marvelous, matchless. His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. What grace, what grace that you've entered our broken. In the fullness of time How far we have fallen from righteousness But not from the mercies of Christ Your cross is our door to redemption Your death is our fullness of life The day of forgiveness go down to Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how great, how sure His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. United in your resurrection, you lift us to infinite heights. Could anything sever or take us from? Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Sing how great, how great, how sure His love.
Hey guys, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Exodus. I'm so grateful that you would join into this video. If you call Exodus home, I want you to know that we love you, we miss you. Uh, we are looking forward to the day that we can gather again together in this space to worship Jesus together. And if you're our guest, we'd love to know that you're joining in. If you would send us an email to the address here at the bottom of your screen. Now, if you'll take your Bible and turn to James 1, we've been in this series in the book of James for a few weeks, and James has been very interested in pressing the truth of God's word into every area of our lives. He's been calling us to a true and living faith that gets worked out in how we live. And James has been very clear. James has not been hard to understand. And today is going to be no different. He's going to be very clear on how this true and living faith gets lived out in our lives. And so he's going to show us what we are called to and he's going to show us that our only hope to see that happen is the power of Jesus in our lives. So I'm going to read James 1, verses 19 through 27. Then I'll pray, and we'll jump into God's word. James says this, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that your word is clear. Thank you that your word speaks into areas of our life where, where we need to listen. And Lord, just like you want us to be quick to listen to one another, I pray that we'd be quick to listen to you and that we would not just listen, but that we would obey, that we would not just be hearers of your word today, but that we would be doers of the word because of the power and presence of Jesus in our lives. So Lord, would you meet with us? Uh, you know every heart listening to this, you know every story, so you're able to speak into every situation in a way that I never could. So Holy Spirit, would you preach a better sermon than I've prepared today? And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Now, before we jump in, I want us to notice in verse 19, he says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person. So that word brothers, beloved brothers, can be translated brothers and sisters. So he's talking to the family of God and he's talking to everyone in the family of God. And this family of God are those who in verse 18 have been brought forth by the word of truth. So this great gospel announcement has had its effect on them. They have heard that they have sinned against God, but that God loved them so much that he sent his one and only son to live, die, and rise again so that all who place their faith and hope in him might be saved. And they have heard that Jesus died on a cross so they could be forgiven of sin, filled with the Spirit, and then set free to live like Jesus in the world. And to these believers... There is a call to true and living faith in their conversations, their conduct, and their care. Now, these are ways our faith is expressed, not ways God's favor is earned. That's really important. All that we're going to talk about today are ways our faith is expressed, not the way God's favor is earned, but these expressions of faith are critical in our lives. Conversations, conduct, and care. We're going to start with conversations. Look at verse 19. He says, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, James is speaking into conversations, and it seems that these conversations have resulted in disagreement because there's this warning about anger at the end of it. 
And he tells them, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Now, you know, you know the kind of conversations that lead to disagreement. Uh, there, there's just plain old disagreement where two people see things differently, and sometimes that can lead to anger, particularly in our polarizing age. The other kind of conversation that might lead to anger is a misunderstanding. You have one person who intends something a certain way, then you have another person who perceives it in a certain way, and what we often do is we fill the distance between intent and perception. We fill that with mistrust, and that leads to anger. We fill the distance between intent and perception with mistrust, and that leads to anger. And so James wants to speak into these conversations because they happen in every area of life. They happen in our friendships, they happen in our marriages, they happen in our workplace, they happen in political discourse, they happen online, they happen in our parenting. All these kinds of conversations happen that often lead to disagreement and perhaps anger, and so James wants to speak into these. And first he begins with this call to be quick to hear. Now, this word could also be translated listen. It means to hear, listen to understanding. It means we listen to learn, we listen to connect, we listen to feel, we listen to understand. When he says be quick to hear, that's what he's speaking about, and most of us are really bad at this, or we have to work really hard at it. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that hearing is not necessarily listening, we know that we can hear people without really hearing people. Second reason it's hard is that we use the same words, but sometimes we mean different things. Just because I say red doesn't mean you hear the same red that I'm saying. We say the same words, but often we mean different things. Third thing is, uh, that can make this a problem is that we can be physically present, but mentally absent. Uh, you, you know what that's like. You come home from a long day, uh, you're, you're sitting in your chair, you're looking at your phone, your kid comes up trying to talk to you, and you're, you're, you're physically there, but mentally absent. Or maybe you're driving down the road. I can't tell you the number of times we've been driving down the road, Cheryl and I are talking, and my mind starts wandering on trees or whatever it is I see out there in the landscape. And about five minutes later, I'll say, hey, sweetie, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to disrespect you, but I, my mind got wandering somewhere. That's one of the reasons it's hard to hear Finally, one of the reasons it's hard to really hear is we often listen to respond rather than hear. We, we listen just long enough to refute what someone's saying rather than really relate to them. So these are reasons it's hard to really listen to understand, and we haven't really gotten to sinful ones yet. Sometimes we don't want to hear, we don't want to listen, we don't want to do the work. But James calls every follower of Jesus to be quick to listen. Then he calls us to be slow to speak. I remember hearing one time that God gave you two ears and one mouth. That means you need to listen twice as long as you talk. I think that's part of what James is getting at here. He says, be quick to hear, slow to speak. Being slow to speak means we listen longer than we think. It means, it means we assume that we don't quite understand exactly what they're saying, particularly if we disagree. We want to be so generous in our listening that if we disagree with somebody, we want to ask clarifying questions like, "Did uh, this is what I heard you say. Is that what you meant to say? Or is this what you mean? We want to clarify what we're hearing so that when we speak, we're speaking truth back to them. We're, we're saying back to them what they actually said to us. Now, this does not mean that we can't speak. Being slow to speak doesn't mean we can't speak, but it means that when we speak, we remember that death and life are in the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18 tells us, that our words have incredible power. So we want to be quick to hear. We want to be slow to speak. And James would say, if we can't learn to be slow to speak, that is a reflection of a spiritual problem. Look at verse 26. He says, If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. James is saying, if you can't learn to be slow to speak, you need to ask whether you're really saved or not. That's what he's saying. I mean, that's a significant warning. So we're to be quick to hear, 
We're to be slow to speak. And then he says we're to be slow to anger. So James warns us about emotional reaction in our conversation. And he warns us about this tendency we have to, to, to just flare up in these conversations. We're to be slow to anger. We're to be long-suffering. We're, we're not to be quick-tempered. We're, we're, to have, um, we're to have kind of a grandparent fuse, not a parent fuse. Now, grandparents have a fuse. And if it runs out, they're going to blow up too. But, but their fuse tends to be longer than parents are. And so we're to be slow to anger, just like God is. God is slow to anger, but abounding in steadfast love. That's what we are to be. But notice, he doesn't say we never get angry. He doesn't say we never get angry. He says we're to be slow to anger. And then James gives a warning to this one. He doesn't give that to the other two, but he gives that to this one in verse 20. He says, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We need to know that our anger does not produce the righteousness of God. It doesn't produce it in ourselves. So if we're angry at ourselves all the time, that's not helping. If we're angry at others all the time, it's not helping. If we're angry, if we're angry with the world all the time, it's not producing the righteousness of God. So James is calling us to be slow to anger when we disagree. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to to anger, And he's calling us to this true and living faith that gets expressed in our conversations with one another. Now, one of the challenges in our world today is that we are so polarized, we're so polarized, that if anyone says anything kind of moving this direction or this direction, we lump them all of a sudden to the pole of what they're saying. Rather than being quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry, we we just polarize one another. And we assume the worst rather than assuming the best in our conversation. Now, one of the areas in our world where listening is really important right now is around issues of racial reconciliation. And as we interact with one another around this issue, we need to follow James' command here in verse 19 and 20. We're to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We all, now I'm talking particularly to my white brothers and sisters, we all need to be quick to listen right now. We need to listen to what's being said. We need to listen to the experience of others. We need to seek to understand by asking follow-up questions to better understand what's being said. And then when we've listened longer than we think is necessary, when we've listened longer than we think is necessary, we need to be slow to speak, and perhaps we start with empathy by saying, look, I, I, I had no idea that was your experience. I'm, I'm, I have no idea how that feels or felt. Maybe we start with empathy. Maybe we start by asking some other questions. So this is what I hear you saying, or are you saying that, or are you saying something different? I just want to make sure I understand. And then when we do disagree, because we will, when we disagree as brothers and sisters, we need to be slow to anger with one another. And we need to learn to talk this out in a way that we can work toward being the brothers and sisters that God has called us here in verse 19. We need to be, we need to be quick to listen. Now, on the other side of not listening long enough, there's an ideology that would suggest that whites should not speak at all in the conversation. The idea that because of historic privilege or power that white people, the only option for white people is to listen to learn, listen and learn, and any attempt to speak into the conversation is the reflection of power and privilege, and this concept's been made popular in the book, White Fragility. It's rooted in an idea called critical race theory and intersectionality. Now listen, I know, I know there were some headlines this week about President Trump and some things he said about critical race theory. I want you to know that we've been planning on this since July. Okay, so my comments are not in reaction to what he may have said. But critical race theory is an unbiblical worldview that sees all relationships through the lenses of power and oppression. So all relationships, everyone falls into two categories, either oppressed or oppressor. And the theory suggests that those who are oppressed have greater access to truth than those who are oppressors. And so the oppressed can speak, the oppressors must remain silent. 
Now, critical race theory also offers a type of salvation. It's liberation through deconstruction and revolution, which ironically is achieved through power, the thing that uh, the framework rejects. So in critical race theory or intersectionality, white people are seen as those who have power and therefore privilege and should remain quiet and learn. And our tendency to speak is seen as a power move that we must resist so that we can learn. Now, I want to be clear. White fragility is a great debate tactic. It's a horrible tool for reconciliation. It's a great debate tactic to say to someone, if you speak at all, you're showing that you're wrong. That's a great debate tactic. It's not going to work toward making us a family. And so somewhere between not listening at all and not speaking at all, James gives us another way. He says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because we're the family of God. We're, We're united by Christ more than our ethnicity. Now, the family of God expresses ethnicity. One day, there's going to be people from every tribe and tongue and nation. The the Great Commission is to go to all ethnicities. Like, ethnicity is not wrong or bad, but we are united in the family of God as a, a, a diverse group of people under Jesus. And so we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. James is very concerned with our conversations. He's very concerned with this call to true and living faith expressed in our conversation. Second, he's concerned about our conduct. Look at verse 22. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So James is calling us to two things here. Not not either or, both and. He's calling us to hear and do. He's concerned about our conduct. Now, our conduct does not earn anything from God, but it expresses our faith in God, and so it is important. And when we hear God's word and don't do it, we're like the man in verse 23 and 24, who looks at himself in a mirror, sees what is wrong or what needs to be changed, then walks away and forgets what he sees. I mean, think about it. You're leaving the house and you look at a mirror before you leave and you see something out of place that needs to be fixed and then you just walk away and don't fix it. That's what he's talking about. James wants us to remember that our conduct matters. It does not save us. It does not earn something, but it is an expression of true and living faith and it matters to God. I mean, how many times, how many times do we read God's word or hear God's word and know that we need to obey, and then we walk away. James would say, if that's our lifestyle, if our pattern is to hear God's word and do nothing, we should ask serious questions about whether we have true and living faith. We should not assume that we have true and living faith if our response to God's word is to hear it and not do it. God did not bring us forth by the word of truth for us to then ignore the word of truth. He's called us to be hearers and doers. So James is calling us to true and living faith in our conversation, in our conduct, and then in our care. Look at verse 27. He says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, he's already talked about our conduct and hearing and doing the word of God. So he's already talked about being unstained from the world. But he talks here in verse 27 about religion that is pure and undefiled. And he speaks of us caring for orphans and widows in their affliction. So for James, care is an expression of true and living faith. He calls it pure and undefiled religion. Now, many times we use the word religion in a negative way. We say, um, we think of religion as a, a list of things to check off to earn something from God. And sometimes that's what it is. Uh, Maybe we say that person's religious, he's really uptight, and sometimes they are. Here, James is using the word religion in a positive sense. He's saying this religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. And what this is, is to care for those in need. And he lists orphans and widows. These people would have had no way to care for themselves in this society. There were no social services, there were no no other other means of help, and James was calling the church to express true and living faith and how they care 
for those in need. Now, I just want to celebrate a few things for us for a moment. I've been so proud of how our church has responded during these times and caring for others. Now listen, we, throughout our history, we've always been a church that wanted to care and serve and be the hands and feet of Jesus. But over the last several months, it's been so evident in the way we've served, whether that's at Mercy Place or North Belmont Elementary or Gaston Street Ministry or with, um, or with Least of These Carolinas. There's a lot of different ways that we've served. And there's opportunities still. There's opportunities for you to express true and living faith in your care for others. And if you want to join in on doing that, you can send an email to info at the exoduschurch.org and we'll connect you. There are ways you can do that that are, that are safe and socially distanced and, and things that you can do perhaps from your own home to care and serve these people. And we want you to do that because pure religion means that we're not just concerned with us and people like us, but that we care for others in real and practical ways. So James is very, very concerned that true and living faith get expressed in our lives, in our conversations, in our conduct, and in our care. And so the question for us today is how will we respond? How will we respond? How will we respond? James says that true and living faith will be displayed in these ways. It will be displayed in how we listen, talk, and relate to one another. It will be displayed in our response to God and his word. It will be displayed in how we care for others. And to this point, uh, James is saying that we, if we are not both hearers of God's word and doers of God's word, we should ask really important questions about the nature of our faith. He would say, if we're hearing God's word but not doing God's word, if we're uh, just running off at the mouth and not bridling our tongue, he would say, look, you need to ask serious questions about the nature of your faith. He would say, your religion is worthless. He, he would say in chapter two, can that kind of faith save? And so how we respond to God's word is really, really important. So how do we respond? Well, there's a few ways we could respond. We, we could actively reject God's word. We could say, look, I don't care how I'm supposed to talk. I'm just a tell it like it is kind of guy. I don't care how I'm supposed to live. I don't care what God's word says. I don't care about other people. Let them handle themselves. We could actively reject what God's word says. We could passively reject what God's word says. We could listen, listen to this video, press stop and kind of going on with our life. We, we could read God's word and see ways that we need to apply what God's word says and we could just kind of ignore it and go on. We could passively reject what God says and whether you actively reject God or passively reject his word, if you reject God's word, James would say you need to be asking serious questions about your soul. You need to be asking serious questions about whether you have a true and living faith. Because James is going to say in chapter 2, can that kind of faith save you? If you're rejecting God, is that kind of faith reflecting a true and living faith? And his answer would be no. Now, another way, another way we can respond is we can say, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to listen well. I've got to speak well. I can't be angry. I've got to do everything the Bible says. I've got to take care of everybody. I, I've got my list. I've got to check off my list and I've got, I've got to do it. Now, James would say that kind of faith is worthless too. It's more active and it looks good out on the outside, but it's not a true and living faith because we're just checking boxes. So James calls us to something more. He calls us not to reject God's word and not to try to figure out how to uh, accomplish God's word. He calls us to something really important here in the passage. Look at verse 21 with me. He says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. He calls us to repent and receive. Notice, notice the first step in, in verse 21 is to put away all filthiness and, and rampant wickedness. We've, the, the first step in our response to this call to a true and living faith in our conversations, our conduct, and our care, the first step is for us to acknowledge, look, I am a sinner. 
I'm a sinner. I have wicked, I have filthiness. I have rampant wickedness in my heart. I need to repent of that. I need to put that away. I need to repent. That's the first step. The first step is to acknowledge, I don't know how sinful I am. God, I need your help. The second step is to receive. He says, therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness. Meekness there means humility. Receive with humility the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Now, James is picking up on some Old Testament imagery here. In the book of Jeremiah, when God is talking about his new covenant that will come in, uh, in with Jesus, when he's talking about the new covenant, he says this, I'm going to take out your heart of stone, I'm going to put in a heart of flesh, and I'm going to put my spirit in you, and I will write my law on your heart. That's what he's talking about. And he says, not only will you have my spirit, not only will my law be written on your heart, you will then do what I say. And so what James is talking about here is the first step when we, when we acknowledge, look, my conversation, conduct, and care does not always reflect the character of Jesus. When we acknowledge that we repent and then we receive, we say, God, do your work in me. Change my heart. Write your word on my heart. Change me. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and then set me free to live like Jesus in the world. So often we understand save your soul as forgiveness of sin. That's a part of the gospel. That's a part of the word of truth. Yes, we are forgiven by Jesus' death on the cross. Then we are filled with the spirit of Jesus and set free to live like Jesus in the world. And so when we acknowledge, when we acknowledge my conversation, conduct, and care does not reflect the the image of Jesus, we repent. We say, God, I'm I'm more sinful than I know. We receive this good news that's better than we could ever imagine. And we're saved. And then, not only do we repent and receive, we remain. Look at verse uh, 25. So he's comparing and contrasting this person who looks in a mirror and forgets with this next person in verse 25. He says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, he's talking about God's word here, the perfect law of liberty and persevere. So not just look and and leave or uh, hear and not do, but look and persevere. Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So when we, see, when we see there are areas of our conversation, there are areas of our conduct, there are areas of care that do not reflect the character of Jesus. We, we, we repent of sin, we receive, we receive from God, and then we remain in God's word longing and looking and seeing the image of Jesus in his word. And when we see Jesus, when we see what God says about Jesus, our lives are changed to look like Jesus. We are blessed in our doing. And so when we see my conversation, conduct, and care does not reflect the character of Jesus, we repent of sin. We receive the implanted word that writes God's law on our hearts and sets us free to obey it. And then we remain in God's word so that our lives are changed, so that our, our lives gradually start to reflect more and more the character of Jesus. And so James calls us, James calls us, to a true and living faith expressed through our conversation, conduct, and care. And our only hope for that is to repent, receive, and remain. So how are we going to respond today? My prayer for us, my prayer for us is that we would respond with repentance, meekness, and a desire to persevere in God's word, that we would repent and receive the implanted word and remain in God's holy word let's do that together so that we can express this call to true and living faith and our conversation conduct and care as the family of god known as exodus church let's pray together father god thank you so much for your goodness to us thank you that though we have sinned and fallen short that that we have all wick a filthiness and rampant wickedness in our hearts that you love us you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us so that we could be forgiven of sin, filled with the Spirit, and set free to live like Jesus in the world. So Lord, would you you capture us with that idea? 
Would you grant a meekness and a, and a desire to persevere in your word so that our faith might be expressed in our lives? Lord, would you change us? Would you make us more like Jesus? Would you do that for our good and your glory, we pray in Christ's name. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hand, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm a wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for a healing light just beyond the clouds though I've walked through fire I see clearly now I know nothing has been wasted no failure or mistakes you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay Make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistakes. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. Shackled by sin, bound for 
the grave You brought my freedom Now reconcile You welcome me in You made me your child Show your love for me When I was sinning When I was weak Jesus, you died Questions arise. I trust you are good. Your way is right. Waves of doubt, storms of despair. The sinker of hope speaks true to my fears. That you show your love for me when I was sinning, when I was weak. Jesus, you died. Afflicted, but never alone. God, you are faithful. I won't be shaken. You are alive, still on your throne. Never forsaken, never abandoned. Sometimes afflicted, but never alone. God, you are faithful, and I won't be shaken. You are alive, still on your throne. When I was weak, Jesus, you died, but came back to life. We who believe also will rise. Glory to God, thanks be to God, praise be to God. You are alive, you are alive. sinning when I was weak Jesus you died we came back to life we who believe also will rise glory to God thanks be to God praise be to God you are alive you are Good morning, Exodus. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. I'm Lindsay Valenti, and I have a few things you're gonna wanna know about this week. First, Exodus Kids will be starting back up on Sunday, October 4th for ages six months through four years old. I have two really small children and they are super excited about getting to be back with their friends and teachers. As the kids ministry is preparing to open, we're looking for volunteers to teach, assist, greet, and clean. If you can help, please let us know and we'll get you plugged right in. To work with our kids, you need to be a member of our church or have been attending for at least six months. If you're new here or maybe you've been around a while and now you're interested in becoming a member, we're having a Next Steps class next Sunday, September 20th in the evening over Zoom. We go over what we believe and what it means to be a part of Exodus Church and we'd love to have you join us. Let us know if you plan to attend and we'll get you all the info you need. Also, don't forget to sign up for the Women's Bible Study, which starts this week, and Financial Peace University, which starts next week. 
You can find all of the info and the links for all of this in the Everything at Exodus newsletter on Realm, or you can email us at info at the Thanks again for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Bye.